Dr. Sita is an emeritus scientist at RRI Bangalore. She superannuated as outstanding scientist from the UR Rao Satellite Center in January 2019 after serving in ISRO for nearly 39 years. She doesn't look a year older than 39 to me herself. Uh, she was earlier director at the Space Science Program Office at ISRO headquarters and was therefore responsible to ensure coordination of all space science activities of ISRO. She is also the principal investigator of the AstroSat, the first dedicated space astronomy mission. Her areas of research is in the field of astronomy, particularly the study of variable stars in X-ray and optical bands. She has contributed extensively to the development of space science instrumentation for Indian science payloads. She has over 80 publications in refer refereed journals and has guided five students for PhD. It has been wonderful having her at RRI and seeing her at lunch a lot. I mean, you know, we have met at lunchtime. She does not have lunch. She has brunch and comes to RRI, spends the whole day with the same energy as when you see her walk into RRI. And it's wonderful that, you know, she has agreed to speak to us on space science activities at RRI on this momentous occasion. Dr. Sita. Thank you, Urvashi, for that wonderful introduction. Distinguished dignitaries and professors, guests and friends, good morning to all. The astronomy group of uh, ISRO has had a long, long uh, association with RRI, starting at least with the 1980s, if not earlier. We had the connection with uh, the Joint Astronomy Program initiated at IASC. We also had the connection with the neighborhood astronomy meetings, which was a wonderful occasion to meet students from various institutions at Bangalore. And then, of course, the X-ray astronomy experiments, uh, which were flown on the satellites, uh, the um, Indian X-ray astronomy experiment on IRSP3, and the data analysis of the same. And finally, of course, AstroSat. And I believe that giant simulations, which we use for high energy X-ray payloads, to simulate the background in these payloads it was also initiated at RRI. So it's a great honor for me to be talking on this momentous occasion to this August audience. And I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Today, I will be talking about the current space science activities at RRI. I will give you an overview of what is happening and it will cover these mainly these three experiments and a few other proposals in which RRI is interested. The first one is the polarimeter instrument in X-rays, short, in short polyx, which is a polarization experiment to be flown on the X-ray polarization satellite called Exposat. The second one is the quantum experiments with satellite technology in short quest. And the third one is probing reionization of the universe using signal from hydrogen, Pratyush for short. Uh, so I will give you an overview of each of these three experiments. And finally, I'll end with the other proposals in which we are interested. The polar, polarimeter instrument in X-rays, POLIX, is led by Professor Biswajit Paul and his team of scientists and engineers. The sun, as we know, emits in the optical domain, that is 
it is emitting radiation predominantly in the optical band and that is how we are able to see all the world around us. However, in the universe there are several sources, celestial sources which emit predominantly in the x-rays and they often have as one of their components exotic objects like neutron stars and black holes which makes them all the more interesting in studying these objects. So, several missions have been flown internationally in x-rays for imaging and to determine the temporal and spectral characteristics of these x-ray sources including our own Indian multi-wavelength mission Astrosat. However, polarization studies which all the X-ray astronomers knew was very important is much long awaited and recently we have had an, uh, an mission which was flown by NASA and Italian Space Agency together. So, when, when the ExpoSat was conceived, it was, the goal was to detect and measure degree and angle of polarization in bright celestial X-ray sources. This operates in the energy range of 8 to 30 kilo electron volts and the sources which we will see will be X-ray binaries with one of the components as black holes or neutron stars. It's uh, the an artistic depiction is shown here. The, the compact object is at the center of what is called an accretion disk. And the accretion disk itself is formed by the matter accreted from the companion star which flows around this compact object. And that leads to the emission of X-rays from these sources. When the compact object is a neutron star, some of these neutron stars may have magnetic fields as high as 10 to the power 12 Gauss. Compare this with the Earth's magnetic field which is important for many of the atmospheric phenomena on our own earth, the earth's magnetic field is less than 1 Gauss. So, we are talking about very, very high magnetic fields around the neutron stars and when the accretion disk flows around these kind of objects, the accretion disk is often disrupted and directed to flow along the magnetic poles. And this leads to several new phenomena around neutron star binaries of this kind. So, we can study polarization from X-ray binaries, pulsars whether they are rotation powered, whether they are accretion powered like this and supernova remnants and bright active galactic nuclei. So, we will come to how this experiment will operate and how we plan to measure this uh, polarization. The polyx itself is based on the principle of Thomson scattering. Incoming X-ray photons are scattered by a scatterer which is here in the form of a disk in our experiment. And if the incoming photon is polarized, then the scatterer will scatter these X-rays predominantly in a particular direction in the azimuthal directions. So, if you surround this scatterer with detectors, X-ray detectors, then one observes a modulation in particular angles in the azimuthal direction. So, we have a beryllium scatterer surrounded by four xenon proportional counters 
which will then observe the intensity of the x ray scattered by the scatterer and based on the modulation we study we will be able to study the degree and the angle of polarization of the incoming x rays from the source this is um, this is the experiment as it looks this is the beryllium scatterer and these are the two detectors this is a cut out two detectors which are surrounding the scatterer finally it will be surrounded by four detectors as is shown in this figure and on top of this uh, on top of these detectors is what is called a collimator it is a physical collimator to restrict the field of view to 3 degrees by 3 degrees just so that this instrument sees only one x-ray source at a time because in the sky there can be several x-ray sources especially in the galactic plane they can be closely spaced uh, the four boxes you see surrounding this detector are the electronics boxes which will process the signals from this proportional counter these are the specifications for the polix experiment uh, i bring a note bring to your notice particularly the energy range uh, as i said polix operates in the 8 to 30 kilo electron volts range and as I said recently, that is in December 2021, the imaging X-ray polarimetry uh, experiment was launched by NISA, uh, NASA and the Italian Space Agency. It operates in the 2 to 8 kilo electron volts range. Hence, we expect the Polix to complement this experiment in space. The Polix itself will be flown on the X-ray Polarization Satellite ExpoSat in a low Earth orbit uh, of with an altitude of around 600 kilometers to give it a life of around 2 to 5 years and with an inclination of less than 30 degrees just so that we can avoid much of the charged particle contribution coming at higher inclination uh, orbits because the charged particles will also be detected by the X-ray counters and they will form part of the background radiation which is detected in these detectors. The absolute pointing accuracy is very modest around 0.1 degree. In addition to surrounding the scatterer by four detectors, we also are requested for a slow rotation of the satellite itself to take care of any inequalities between the detectors themselves and also so that in we can provide also redundancy of some to some of the detectors in case needed. We will be observing these individual sources for several weeks. Uh, maybe few week, few weeks and occasionally if it's a faint source we will also be observing it for about two months time this is to build on the signal of polarization signal uh, we will try to operate it in the maximum possible duty cycle the status of this experiment is that the qualification model is completed and tested and the results are already discussed. The flight model is under assembly and testing and we hope we are looking forward to see this experiment operational in 2023. Uh, this is the configuration of the satellite. The experiment itself sits on the top deck surrounded by this electronics. And in addition to this experiment, we also have an X-ray spectrometer experiment which will study the 
spectra of these sources for the same time duration when the polyx is studying the polarization. Um, the solar panels after deployment will actually look in the body in this direction because we plan to see most of the sources in the anti-sun direction because this experiment can't look at the sun which is also a source of x-rays and the sun will be in the other direction or slightly away from the anti-sun direction. With this, I come to the next experiment called the QUEST, the quantum experiments with satellite technology. This is led by Urbashi Sinha and her team. Quantum communication is so-called key to secure communication. The present communications are subject to eavesdropping and uh, they can be, the algorithms by which these communications are done can be cracked, especially with uh, upcoming sophisticated com computer technologies and skills. You might have heard of many people's bank accounts being accessed and so on and this is all due to and some uh, what do you call the passwords being broken into etc. This is due to the cracking of the algorithms and uh, so the best thing in quantum communications is to actually use entangled photons for quantum communication and we use entangled photons as a means to be to provide quantum key distribution QKD for short. Entangled based quantum quantum key distribution further improves security because it will also be device independent even if the device is tampered with after the key has been distributed the the key itself will work irrespective of how the device is tampered with. Using the satellite as a node would ensure secure long distance quantum communications. Uh, it's noteworthy to mention that experiments in quantum entanglement and similar experiments as I'm going to show you today is what led to the Nobel Prize this year in physics. The 2022 Nobel Prize is awarded to experiments in entanglement of photons. QUEST itself is India's first project proposal on satellite based communication initiated in September 2021 as a joint project of ISRO and RRI sorry, 2017, sorry. Uh, the goals of QUEST are establishment of information theoretically secure quantum communication over large distances and therefore they have to be satellite based. And for security, perform entanglement based quantum key distribution between two Indian ground stations using a satellite as a node. So, uh, a satellite will receive a quantum key from one ground station and as it orbits to the other, other uh, ground station, it will exchange another key with the second ground station. And this is what is being done at this lab of quantum information and computing lab at Arada. The key components for this realizing this experiment are a source capable of providing entangled photons, ground stations for transmission and reception, and satellites for transmission and reception. What has been achieved at RRI so far is 
modified B92 protocol has been implemented in the lab by which entangled photons have been generated and they have been measured and the communication has been established in the lab itself and this has led to the first publication from India on this implementation in a reviewed journal. The protocol established globally competitive key rate of 50 kilohertz with a quantum bit error of 4.79 percent which is globally very competitive. Develop in addition to this, a QKD simulation software has been developed at RRI and this software has enabled the, the comparison of the experimental results with the simulated results which is very, very satisfactory. And uh, therefore, this simulation software, a patent has been applied for this simulation software too. In the lab, an entangled based QKD has been distributed and um, this again has led to a publication which is in uh, process of being accepted. A demonstration of quantum communication has been done over two buildings at RRI at a distance of 50 meters which is a distance for free space which we could get at this campus. We also did developed a prototype for a moving receiver lab because uh, we need to prove that we can align the receiving station and the transmitting station to receive these photons to the tune of fraction of an arc second and the first step towards that is to uh, demonstrate that indeed we can re receive, uh, receive these photons even if the photon source, if the source is, no, is moved and it is a moving receiver which is on the platform. So I will show you now two uh, movies. Um, I request the movies to be played, demonstrating these two um, achievements. So this is a lab in which entangled photons are generated and this is where it leaves the one lab that, is, that we term as Alice's lab and then moves on to be received from the other lab which is 50 meters away which we call as Bob's lab and it is received here and then the decoded here and we find that the quantum key decoded here uh, can indeed demonstrate the quantum key distribution over 50 meters of length. The second movie here is where we move the receiver based on a gimbal, gimbal mounting of the optics itself and this movement as you can see on the screen can be tracked and brought back to the center position using an automatic tracker. Yeah, the, the spot which was moved has been brought back to the center position. So this has been demonstrated in the lab. The next step is to demonstrate it actually with a moving receiver and which we plan, which is, it, which it is planned to be completed by the year end 2022 outside the lab. Uh, this is a, a block diagram of this moving receiver which we plan. Um, the transmitter will, will have a beacon and uh, 
that will be tracked by the moving receiver and then we will receive the um, the key the way forward we think we are now ready to go on to the to embark on satellite based the systems and so um, the downlink based communication has already been established globally so so rri proposes for an uplink based quantum communication this enables the photon source to be on the ground and this provides that we can change the photon source based on the technological development in the coming years to improve the source capabilities on the ground so uh, in the uplink based uh, a uh, transmission transmitter 1 will generate qkd and will uplink it to the satellite and transmitter 2 at another ground station will again uplink the second key we now as i said we now need to embark on the space segment in collaboration with isro we need to drop the requirements and the specifications for both the ground based and the space based systems and uh, the design and development for this uplink based communication pointing and tracking requirements are very very stringent for this experiment and that also has to be developed and qualified for this experiment ground stations and site identifications for the same will also have to be done finally i come to this probing reionization of the universe using signal from hydrogen this is led by professor mayuri s rao saurabh singh and team again coming back to astronomy i moved from x ray photons to optical photons and now i am going to radio frequencies with this experiment the concept of uh, pratyush itself is to detect a spectral signal from hydrogen as all of you know hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe hydrogen has one proton and one electron and the ground the there is a hyperfine splitting of the energy level of this neutral hydrogen atom when the spin of the proton and the neutron are parallel and when they are anti parallel and transition from one one of these levels to the other level leads to what is called the h1 line, line which is at 1420 megahertz or it is often referred to as the 21 cm line the 21 cm line has been known for several decades and it has been used to study our own galaxy its uh, properties its dynamics its morphology and it has also been used to study further from our galaxies to study outside the uh, milky way galaxy itself we propose to use this hydrogen one line to probe into the early universe uh, we know that the cosmic microwave background is has been detected and that is 400000 years after the big bang after that there is a period of dark age when we do not have any emission other than probably 
the hydrogen 1 emission which is not yet detected so far. And then when the, when the first stars and galaxies start to form, which is termed as the start of the epoch of reionization, again we start to see this 21 centimeter line, this time in absorption both in the dark ages and in uh, the EOR starting, it is in absorption and but when the after the start of the epoch of reionization, it is deeper than it is in the dark in ages. So, we, we probe, we plan to probe somewhere just before this epoch of reionization and till the end of the epoch of reionization. Because this line is coming from a early universe, it will probe high red shifts of the order of 30 to 8 over the frequency range of 40 to 200 megahertz. The several models, theoretically several models have been proposed to study this line. And depending on what are all the other phenomena which affects this line like the Lyman alpha contribution due to the first stars and galaxies, the X-ray emission itself coming from the galaxies, etc. And the variation in this uh, emissions and the parameters connected with these emissions, there are several models proposed for how this line would look at this megahertz range and this line in black is the standard vanilla model and there are various other models as you can see from this uh, graphs. Please note that what we are seeing against the cosmic microwave background is a brightness temperature of only point 0.2. Kelvin or so to say typically 100 milli Kelvin or maximum of 200 milli Kelvin. So, it is a weak signal compared to the foreground galactic signal which is very very bright. In addition, we are we need to observe it in this frequency range of 80 to 140 megahertz and extending it all the way to 200 megahertz till the end of epoch of reionization. So, the sky signal has to be retrieved after removing the bright foreground galaxy emission. So, the goal of Pratyush itself is to detect the cosmic hydrogen 1 signal and we would like to be the first team to detect this signal. It is very, very challenging and it is also globally very, very competitive because there are several teams addressing to detect this signal. We ourselves, sorry, uh, the first uh, part of this Pratyush experiment plans to probe this signal in the 55 to 110 megahertz range which will sample a z from 25 to 50. The experiment itself consists of an antenna and a reflector which is seen here the monopole antenna and its reflector and the analog and digital electronics along with the proposed spacecraft electronics. The laboratory model for this experiment has been designed and fabricated and, is it, and it is being tested in the lab here. One of the challenging things is that the, all the electronics has to be housed within this reflector to avoid coupling between the payload electronics itself and the incoming radiation from the antenna. So, um, um, 
this is the uh, block diagram here is the antenna which is developed and its reflector and this is the uh, digital electronics and um, which is housed there is an analog receiver calibre receiver and the digital receiver uh, the analog receiver also has capability to calibrate the signals and the digital receiver actually digitizes the analog signals and allows the storage of the signals in the satellite and it will uh, store it in the satellite bus right now uh, we are we have developed the first three modules so uh, we are again ready to embark on the satellite version as i said the signal signal is very weak to detect because we are aiming to detect a 100 milli kelvin brightness temperature signal in addition i said that the frequency range is in the 80 to 100 megahertz and as you know this frequency range is where much of the man made frequencies especially the fm based frequencies lie and therefore it's extremely difficult to detect it from ground so we need rf quiet regions on the ground to detect this uh, uh, to even do integrated testing of the payload leave alone to detect this signal uh, we need a good rf shielding box Uh, for housing all the electronics and the earth itself can affect the signals which are detected so we need a grounding plane and so on in addition of course the ionosphere affects the incoming signal and that also is a major stumbling block considering all these problems the best platform for detecting the signal is an orbiter around the moon and detection of this signal in the when the orbiter is on the far side of the moon so that we use the moon itself to block much of these unwanted signals which form the background for us however we realize that a moon based experiment may take some time to come meanwhile at rri there has been a team which has been working on a ground based experiment of the same pratyush called saras uh, which has been implemented and it has also been deployed on the ground and uh, how we avoid this electronics uh, uh interference between the electronic system and the antenna is by keeping the two separated by 100 meter using a cable this has been deployed in rf quiet regions uh at uh, close to bangalore at hanle and now and we have also deployed it on lakes to avoid the effects from the earth surface several results have resulted from this experiment one of the major results recent results has been uh, that we have been able to refute a few of these models shown in brown and also this major detection which was reported by the edges USA experiment which was deeper than what was proposed by the theoreticians almost twice as deep but we did not detect it and we have refuted that this signal may indeed not be the true signal from the um, early universe and this has been published in nature astronomy so now what are we proposing we propose a phase 1 uh, of 
this experiment in leo orbit at the earliest so that we can get on to the space platform to prove that indeed we can detect the signal without the effects of the earth and also the ionosphere though we might still be hampered by a little of the man made noise for this we are already in interaction with isro and we need to optimize the mass power and volume of this instrument so that we can house all of it and the spacecraft electronics within that reflector and maybe we might have to reiterate on the design itself to accommodate everything the second phase of course is we would like an orbit around the moon this needs to be deployed separately this experiment needs to be deployed separately around the orbit around the moon at around 100 km altitude around the moon so this is our request for a forthcoming uh, mission to detect the signal uh, as part of the simulations uh, we we think that all the uh, signals shown in blue here can be addressed with a leo orbit and uh, the ones in orange can be addressed with a uh, lunar orbit finally i come to other proposals in which rri will be interested in an indian satellite to further study the cosmic microwave background uh, has was proposed some time back this requires sensitive detectors operating at cryogenic temperature temperatures as a first step we are actually uh, uh, starting our interactions with isro on terahertz detectors going on to later gigahertz which will be needed for this cosmic microwave background we are collaborating on the science aspects and site evaluation with isro and we are also part of the scientific team the national scientific team called the indian sub millimeter astronomers alliance for terahertz observation of course we plan to continue our connection with the x-ray astronomers in the in the country with uh, collaboration in the future experiments like daksha and other proposed polarization experiments and spectroscopic experiments we are also interested in working with ncra rri uh, towards creating a larger deep space network uh using aperture synthesis with all the experience with gmrt uh we we have proposed that we could create a much larger antenna by doing aperture synthesis of smaller antennas and this was initially proposed with by ncr at of tfr and we would like to join them in this endeavor and uh, this would be very fruitful for future interplanetary missions when we plan to go to farther planets like the jupiter saturn etc and also to receive weaker and weaker signals from the closer planets so with this i thank all the pis of this instruments for providing me with the material and the information and i had long discussions with them and i also thank all of you for the patient hearing thank you all we look forward to many many fruitful results coming from this collaboration between rri and isro thank you